Hi friends! Today I'm going to be running through several of my sort of self-help help kinds of products. Like there's a there's a lot of self-help stuff out there, and some of that some of it is um, not great, and some of it is excellent. And so I just wanted to give you some of my thoughts on what I think leads to excellence, um, and some of my favorite favorite things. Uh, so I'm gonna start with this book. This book is, you can see, well-loved uh, by me. It's called Growing Up Again. The argument of this book um, is, uh, you know, how you could kind of reparent yourself. If you, if in your therapy or in your, um, you know, exploration of self-help topics, even just your own education of yourself, You've come across information such as attachment styles or ideas around neglect and abuse or um, what is trauma and and you're trying to um, coach yourself through those things. Uh, you know, I, I, therapy is not something that everybody can do. Not everybody can afford it. Not everybody has the time for it. Not, not everybody enjoys sharing the experience with, um, with a therapist and, and that's fine. Um, but I, I want people to use good tools for doing self work. And this is one of those books. So, um, it's called growing up again. And, um, you know, I probably the best, the best way that I enjoy using this program is actually in a group therapy setting, uh, in group therapy, I always say, uh, everybody is a client and everybody is a therapist because you're, you're working together to, um, you know, attend to everybody. So everybody is getting their needs met, their therapeutic needs met, but they're also supporting everybody else in the group. And, um, it's, it's a really, it, for those of you who've been through group counseling, it's a really enriching experience. So my very favorite application of this tool is in group therapy. My second favorite is, um, doing the work in the book, but then working with the therapist to kind of metabolize or digest the content. And then my third favorite way to use it is strictly a self-help. So it's called Growing Up Again. It's by Jean Ilsley Clark and Connie Dawson. I'll put the, this is probably reversed for you. I will put it in the, um, in the show notes with a link to it. Um, but let me give you my favorite part of this book are these charts. So, um, so like I mentioned, the, the target for this is like somebody who is coming to terms with the fact that they have some stuff from the way they were parented that they need to address. Um, you've heard me say before that the research on raising healthy children, you know, like if you are have become a parent, the best outcomes for your children as a parent, the best outcomes for your children is to, is to work on your stuff. Um, and that can be concurrent. I mean, ideally we would get that all straightened out, um, before we become parents, but not everybody is doing that. So, uh, it, it, you kind of maybe don't even know that you need to do it until you start getting into parenting and, and you're triggered and having all kinds of issues and don't understand why you don't, um, have better control over your emotions and that sort of thing. Um, so, so certainly if you're parenting and you're trying to make sure that you're a better parent than maybe the way that you were parented, like that you might learn from some of the mistakes that were made in the care and keeping of you when you were little, this is a good book for that. Uh, so the subtitle on it is Parenting Ourselves, Parenting Our Children. And um, so you can, you can use it as a reference manual for kind of, Structure and nurture are the main themes. Structure and nurture uh, as a parent or parenting yourself, reparenting. Um, because it's it, it's good to know what has gone on for you, but we don't want to remain there. We want to we want to grow out of that and heal from that. So let me show you my favorite, my favorite, favorite, favorite part of this book for anybody. Um, 
there are these charts in here. There's a structure chart and a nurture chart. And the way that this is laid out, you guys, is so great. I don't know that you can see it well at all, but if you, you know, check this out from the library or buy a copy for yourself. So this, for example, is the structure chart. And the way that it's presented in the book is, imagine a, a multi-lane highway or road, and you have sort of the main lanes that are going, sorry, my little ponytail holder on my hand, uh, the main lanes that are going, um, that are, that are optimal. And then you have sort of the, um, like the shoulder of those, which are, you know, functional, but not optimal. And then you have the ditch. Okay. And so the ditch is like, we don't want to be there. And so then it's framed that way across structure and across nurture. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain it a little bit better with examples. So um, the structure chart, um, so I don't know if you can see, but see there are six columns. There's three over here and three over here. And these two lanes sort of represent the you're going to do pretty well if you're doing structure across multiple domains right down this lane of the highway. You're going to do really, you're going to be satisfied and be doing the good job of structure in both of these. Okay. And those are, um, oh gosh, what do they call them? Like those with negotiable things and with non-negotiable. That's not the right terms. Hold on. I got myself reoriented to the book. Okay, so in these middle two lanes, the title of the columns are non-negotiable rules and negotiable rules. And the and the theory that the authors make is that as long as you're as long as you're here, you can. We don't all have to be. We we all have such different um, perspectives on things and different ideas of things, and we don't all need to do things the same way. But there are sort of like optimal. The best version we can get is in these two lanes. And then we have sort of functional, but not great on these two lanes. Do you see where I'm kind of pointing there? Okay, so those two lanes are uh, criticism and marshmallow. So one being more extreme on structure and the other being weak on structure. So, so if you, so the argument is that if you're in the, if you're in the middle two lane, although you can have more structure or less structure but still be in these main two lanes um and the book is has tons of examples of what that means uh that's still going to be very good like there's variation there's personality there's temperament there's um in, you know the relationship we between uh between a kiddo and a parent is is unique um and so you can have you know not, not everybody needs to be the exact amount of rigidity or or um, marshmallowness or whatever, uh, as long as we kind of like are in those middle two lanes, healthy, healthy relationship building, healthy um, parenting strategies. And then you get over kind of on the shoulder and it's still functional, right? It's one is way less structure and one is more structure than is ideal, um, but still functional, right? We're gonna do okay. And then over in the far side, we have the we have the ditch side over here and the ditch side over here. And that would be very far on rigidity or very loosey-goosey on it, right? So the titles are abandonment and that would be, you know, I'm not attending to you at all. So there's no structure. Do whatever you like. Um, that's just a label of it. It's not actually abandonment as in leaving the child, but abandoning in a way. And I'll give you some examples of that. And then on the far end is like super rigid. So those aren't leading to good outcomes. Um, so this, so the structure, um, chart looks like this and then, you know, you can recognize yourself across different domains. So for example, um, let's say you've got, let's say you're, you're, you, you were a teenager that was drinking alcohol or you are parenting a kiddo that's drinking alcohol. That's the premise, right? Like either you're reparenting yourself and reconsidering the, the way that you were raised 
or um, you're in the middle of parenting and you're addressing this. So in the middle two lanes with a 13 year old who's drinking alcohol, okay, there's on the healthy column, healthy column, still in the middle two lanes, a healthy column, a parent might say, a parent who's a little more structured, but not overly so. A parent says, uh, you can't drink alcohol until you reach legal age. We expect you to honor the rule. Um, we expect you, um, oh, sorry, we expect you to honor the rule. If you don't honor the rule, there are going to be really tough consequences for you. Okay. And also a really healthy approach to that with less, with more negotiable rules. And I do tend to Personally, I tend towards that because I'm about like shared control and I have some other things going on um, with me. Um, and that's the point is like it should be individualized. Um, okay, so in the negotiable rules, but healthy is a parent says um, there are kids whose number one priority is drinking. When do you think it's okay uh, with kids who drink? I'm sorry. When do you think it's okay to be with kids who drink? Um, how can you find kids who don't drink so you don't spend all your free time with the ones who are drinking, right? So it's setting up a conversation for shared control and development of, of the kiddo's own thoughts about alcohol. And I mean, that's not in a vacuum, like you've done all of your good communication building with your kiddo, et cetera. So that's just an example. So um, if you think about those two examples, you, you may not drink until you reach the legal age. We expect you to honor that rule. If you don't honor it, there are going to be some tough consequences for you. Okay? Perfectly acceptable. Similarly, also perfectly acceptable. There are kids whose number one priority is drinking. When do you think it is okay to be with kids who drink? How can you find kids who don't drink so you don't spend all of your free time with the ones who are drinking? Okay, so think about just those two little examples. It's just two little examples. There's a million things that come up in parenting. This is part of why it's so freaking exhausting, right? But with the just with those two little descriptions, which one lands for you? As I was reading it aloud, I was like, oh, I see myself more in the negotiable rules side of things. Mine tends to be more on the less, more on the less, more on the less structured side, but still pretty structured is the point. Okay. Where do you find yourself? Do you, are you, do you lean more towards the more rigid side of things, the more, the more structured and still in that space? Okay. So that, so the, so the premise of the book is both of those are, are, are going to lead to families that are in good communication. Um, you know, they also talk about why structure is important. Um, and so, you know, you're a functioning balance of structure and nurture in your household. Okay, so then we get into um, the next level out. So it's these two columns here. You see, I got my pinky and my pointer finger. <laughs> um, I should really do my nails. Okay, on the more rigid side, more leaning towards higher structure is probably the right way to say it. Mother says, you're always doing something stupid. Now you are drinking. You're just like your dad. Okay, so that's that's critical. You're making a critical comment about a kiddo. It's high in structure, but it's got a critical nature to it. And so we, we would call that kind of being in the shoulder. It's not absolute rigidity, which is in the ditch, but it's high structure. I, don't, I wonder how you would feel about hearing that. If you did hear it when you were a kid, something critical like that. Um, or if you lean towards the, the, um, the shoulder of the road, it's called marshmallow on the other side. And it would be, um, a parent says, if all kids drink, I suppose you can. Or you're too young to drink and drive, so you can have a kegger here. Or kids will be kids. Okay, so that's not abandonment, and the criticism one is not rigidity. So it's not all the way in the ditch, but it's not as healthy as non-negotiable rules and negotiable rules. Does that make sense? These are just examples, and it's all just focused on this sort of drinking example. Um, 
kind of want to abandon this and start over, but I'm going to keep going. Okay, so then the last two, what we would consider the ditch. On the rigid side, the example is the parent says, if you ever touch alcohol again, don't bother coming home. And on the abandonment side, parent says, I don't want to talk about it. Parent is not available, either physically or emotionally, is, is drunk or mentally ill or ignores or teases the child, just abandons the matter. I'm not going to attend to the matter. So um, I really, I really like this layout of the chart with like just an example. So you can see across those six lanes, two in the ditch, two on the shoulder and two in the sort of healthy zone. And in addition to that, there's the nurture version of it. And it goes through sort of the, the healthy ones are assertive care and supportive care. So again, leaning more towards high nurture or low nurture. And you have the same six, you have the same six um, lanes, but now we're on the concept of nurture, okay? And so we'll go down here again to the example and I'll go through the example with you. The example on nurture, um, a school age child has a badly scraped arm. Okay, so we've got a nowie. In the assertive care, which is one of the healthy lanes, the parent cares for the wound in a loving way and says, your arm is scraped, I'm sorry. Okay, and in the supportive care, also a healthy lane. Parent has already taught the child how to clean up a scrape. Okay, that's in, in uh, brackets. And then it says in a concerned and loving tone, I see you scraped your arm. Does it hurt? Do you want to take care of it yourself or would you like some help from me? And offers a hug. So thinking about those two, caring for the wound in a loving way as a school-age child. Caring for the wound in a loving way, saying your arm is scraped, I'm sorry. Think about that. How would you, how did you receive that information when you were a kiddo? How would you want to approach it as a parent? And um, having already taught your kiddo, so then in the supportive care, having already taught your kiddo how to take care of owies, um, you say in a concerned and loving tone, I see you scraped your arm, does it hurt? Do you want to take care of it yourself or would you like some help from me? And then offers a hug, okay? So where would you place yourself on that in terms of what you received and also what you would what you would want to what you would want to do in reparenting yourself or in parenting um, your kiddo? So then we go to the shoulder, right? So this isn't the ditch, this is the shoulder. And on the higher, let's see. The higher, how do we want to phrase that? It's called conditional care on this end of the spectrum, okay? And that is in that same experience, the parent says, stop crying or I won't bandage your arm. I will just a side note, I have a lot of empathy for a parent who's saying something like that. I don't like that kind of approach with kids, but I understand why a parent would be driven to have that response and it has to do with your attachment style. So, um, you know, for people who need really concrete example to understand why and how, uh, this book is really good because you might see yourself saying something like that. And it has to do with how triggered you are by your kiddo, by, your, by the way. Um, I have a lot of empathy for triggered parents. So the parent in the conditional care, so it's conditional care, uh, stop crying or I won't bandage your arm. And in what is called overindulgence on this nurture chart, uh, the parent rushes to the child and says, oh, look at your arm, you poor thing. That really stings. I'll bandage it. Go and lie down in front of the television and I'll do your chores for you. Okay, so that's not terrible parenting. Like that's the thing. Like that's not terrible, but it's not as healthy as supportive care and assertive care. So it's just not as healthy. We could do better than that. Um, and then the, the book, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other pages, right? The book talks to you about why overindulgence is a problem or why conditional care is a problem. It, it helps you understand the why. Um, I'm just pulling out the example in this video.
Okay, and then sort of in the in the two in the in the ditch sides of this uh, metaphorical road, we have the abuse and we have neglect. Okay, so on the abuse, um, in terms of nurture, uh, with a school aged child who has a badly scraped arm, the parent does not care for the wounds. It says, "Stop sniffling, or I'll give you something to cry about." Yells at or shakes the child. Okay, again, this is a triggered parent who's behaving that way. And if you find yourself um, replaying those kinds of messages because of your parenting, this is a good book to work through to figure out how to reparent that and come at it differently for your own physiology and well-being. And then if you're parenting, even more so, so that we're not passing along those kinds of um, nurture abuse messages. Okay. And then likewise... Um, on neglect, in terms of nurture, parent ignores the scrape. If they do, if they say anything, they're saying, "Don't bother me." Completely opting out. Okay, if if that is how you feel you were parented, this is a good book for you to work through. Uh, if you are triggered into that level of avoidance with your kids, where you know you're neglectful, you're not even on the shoulder. This is a good book to work through. And if it brings up difficult stuff for you, do the book and take um, take the book to the therapist and go, this is what is coming up for me. You, you can find a therapist who will work with you through this. Um, okay, so, and then the rest, so then the bulk of the book is going through techniques to reparent yourself. There's some nice quizzes in here. Um, there's, you know, explanations of what denial is, um, just a bunch of like really useful, um, problem solving strategies. And, uh, one of the best self-help books I've come across and one of the best group therapy, uh, workbooks to share in group therapy because you can assign the reading and the work and then come in and discuss it and debrief it with other people who are trying to reparent themselves or or are trying to get organized so that they're a better parent to their kiddos. So I hope you found this helpful. Um, again, I will put the title of the book uh, and the authors in the show notes. And um, yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully if this is the right book for you, you will you will find it and, uh, and get to work on it. All right. I'll see you on the next one.